to show you uh, a very highly regarded way of taking notes. It's uh, very popular among people who need to take good notes. So, in fact, uh, there are a number of medical schools. Um, keep in mind, a medical school is a, a place you go after you graduate from college. You do your pre-med and then you go to medical school. You've already graduated college, you're a college graduate, you would think college graduates know how to take notes, okay? They've got it down. But there are medical schools, uh, I law schools, that require all of their students to take notes the way that I'm about to show you. Okay? It's got to be pretty good if they're requiring their students to take notes this way, okay? So I'm just trying to sell you on it. Um, I, I don't want to have to force you to take notes in a certain way, but I really recommend this way. If, it, if you take stellar notes, and they are really <coughs> useful to you, and when you go back to study them, you know exactly where to find everything, and um, they're just incredibly useful to you, then then fine. And if they are, then you probably take notes similar to the way I'm going to show you. Okay? Uh, so to start, put yourself uh, maybe mm, three or four lines above the bottom. Your line across here, darker color, and over here, you're just gonna draw a column that just kind of gives you enough room to jot a few little quick questions. Okay, so you judge it. How big you write, that kind of thing determines that. So, but you don't want to write through the middle. That's it's taking away too much of this. Okay. So this is the main part of your notes. This would basically be your basic note taking. You just write down the things that get written up here, um, maybe little you know, side notes and things like that. But the key thing is, as you're writing along, and you come to a point where you have a question of any kind, of any degree of importance, whatever the question, take that as a cue from your brain that it's confused about something. It's a good thing to know. All right, if you know when your brain is confused about something, you have some useful insight, all right? If it's confused about it now, it could very likely be confused about it later. The thing about memory is it's not very good, okay? And you may not even remember being confused about that thing, all right? If you're confused about something, you wanna not be confused anymore. So here's how we do it. Here's the best way that I've ever heard. When we're taking notes and you find that you have a question, write it down, okay? Feel free, and I encourage you strongly to also at the same time raise your hand and ask that question. Okay? So if you ever asked a question in class, you got it answered, and when you got home, still didn't quite understand it, probably that happens to you. Okay? So you write the question down. Now you know what that question was. You've recorded that little ding that went off in your head of the, the time that your brain was confused. Okay? Then, hopefully, Soon, after you write this question down, uh, you've got my attention and asked me a question and now I'm answering it, okay? And now you write down the answer to your question, okay? Maybe a short answer, maybe a long answer, okay? But now, here you have a connection between the thing that confused you and the thing that uh, remedies that confusion. Give yourself a little indication, hey, that question got answered and I can find the answer here. And, and now when you go back and you look at the question, you know what the answer to that is. Now, this part you understood, this part you were confused about, you got the question answered, like everything that you know you know and everything you didn't know you have the answer to. Then you're going along and you have another question, you write that here, maybe you did a few things, and then somebody else asked that question and there's your answer. You know, let yourself know where the answer to that question is, okay? So we, at the end of this page, we have three, four, five, seven questions uh, that are our own. They are a signal from our brain that it's confused. And you go home, you cover this up, you take a look at these questions, and what we're doing is going back through all the things that our brain didn't understand and seeing if the answer stuck. And so you can read this question and answer it without looking at this part learn something. If you can't, you have the answers right there and you feel free to study it again. 
right? It's a great tool to use because a lot of the things that I want to, I would like to be able to help you with are a reliance on your memory. Relying on your memory, you remember things that are important as far as a thought you had, especially a thought that you had, or something you need to do at some point. Something that's not in your long-term memory. Trying to hold things in your short-term working memory is a bad, bad idea. It is not equipped to do that, okay? Trying to shove all that stuff in that short-term memory is not gonna work very well. Uh, and if you go home and you haven't written these things down, most likely you just don't even remember them at all. So you remember it at, at the wrong time, okay? If you ever tried to remember you're supposed to take out the trash or something, you haven't set that up for yourself, you haven't set a reminder in some way that you need to do that, like maybe a list for, for each day of the week. And for me, every Wednesday is trash day, and if I were taking my own advice, I would make a list as it tells me to take out the trash, okay? Uh, I myself forget lots of things. So if you've ever tried to remember to do something and you've forgotten, or remember it exactly the wrong time, like you're driving away and the bus is pulling away and you look at your driveway and realize, oh, you're supposed to put the trash out on the driveway. And that's too late, okay? Your brain is bad at remembering things and reminding you of things. Okay. Long-term memory is a different thing. But when you're trying to just remember what happened in class, you're just like, yeah, I think I got it. That doesn't work, right? So write those questions down, get those questions answered, and now you have like a whole body of knowledge. All the gaps are filled in. Yes? Uh, never mind. I was going to ask, what do you do on the bottom? Yep. I will tell you. Okay. That was, I was just about to go there. So this is a summary. Okay. Now what this does is it just forces your brain to process the information in a different way. And it gives you a useful tool for later. And what you do here is you write two, three, maybe four sentences about what is up here. Think about it, you're taking all this information, you're almost like a guy who writes Cliff's Notes, right? The guy who writes Cliff's Notes needs to know something about the book in order to find all the important pieces and summarize it. That's your job with your notes. You're summarizing everything that's happened up here into a very brief synopsis so that you or anyone who reads this will know what's going on up here. And forcing yourself to just put that in a few sentences is the key to this part of the notes. So write a few sentences at the end. You can write it right after you're done with this page. You can write it when you, uh, there's just a brief moment when I stop talking. There's uh, you know, after class, after school. Try to do it as soon as possible because you know, everyone's fresh in your mind. But what you've done, you, you've thought about this information in so many different ways. Just writing it down is great. Writing down your question, you've thought about it in yet a different way. Getting that question answered, you're thinking about it another way. You now have a way to review it, and your brain has is engaged in a different way. You have to summarize it, like someone who writes Cliff's Notes, and you force your brain to think about it in yet another form. Okay? So if you take notes this way, I promise you it will be beneficial. If you do it halfway, half-heartedly, well, it may not work as well as I promised. You've got to go whole hog they say, you gotta go all in and take notes like this. Again, if you take great notes, probably because you take them similarly to this way, uh, if you don't take good notes, here's a way to take good notes. I, I wish somebody had shown me this when I was in school. I had no idea until I was learning to be a teacher and I learned about this kind of note taking. I'm not good it does me now. I've done a lot of notes taking style learning. So that's kind of over. But I try to take notes like this if I ever have a meeting or that and it really is helpful. So there you go. Any questions about it? No? It's called the Cornell method. You can actually buy pads of paper that are already made up like this. Right? They're already devised up that. So popular is this method of taking notes. They make pads of paper just for that. So now we're gonna get started uh, talking about one subject that never seems to fail Strike the strike fear in the heart of math students. That would be fractions. Okay? People tend not to like fractions, probably because at some point they've gotten mixed up about fractions. They can't remember how they're supposed to do this and that. Alright? 
So let's go through each of those things. Uh, my goal here, at the very least, is to reduce the number of mistakes you make when working with fractions. That's going to be a good deal if I can help you, you know, make 20% fewer mistakes with fractions, then that's a good thing, right? The best I can hope for is that you will be able to explain to somebody else very clearly and fluidly why we treat fractions the way we do, why we find common denominators, why we multiply straight across, why we multiply by the reciprocal denominator, why do all these things happen, okay? Not because we remember them, but because we understand them. The shame of it is most of us approach a lot of kinds of learning, especially mathematics, in a way that if someone were to speak with confidence and tell you absolute lies, and tell you all the wrong way to do math, you would believe them and you would just do it that way. But I want you to question that. I want you to, just like you might question someone's motives or whatever like that, you want, I want you to question why we do things with numbers the way that we do them, okay? We're going to go through fractions, I'm going to explain to you why, and I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a, an alarm that might go off in your brain if, if you go to make one of those common mistakes. Okay? So what is something that we do with fractions that maybe mistakes happen? Adding the bottoms, you mean Nobody. like that's a mistake that we get from. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's, that would be the most common way people mistakenly add fractions. Uh, but you know, subtracting fractions, that would be something where we make a mistake. Multiplying fractions, dividing fractions. That's pretty much all you can do with fractions, right? Those are all, those are all four what we call binary operators addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And those are the ones that are top mistake. Talk about adding fractions. I know that most of you probably know you're supposed to find common denominator, and uh, I don't doubt that you can do that if I ask you to. But I want you to be able to not make mistakes in this situation. So we're going to look at how to do it correctly. What gets done when it's incorrect? Why the correct way is correct? Why the incorrect way is incorrect? Okay, so we're going to add some fractions like two thirds plus. Um, and three and four fifths. And two thirds, four fifths. Very common mistake would be six eighths. The person who does this is someone who is relying on their short term memory to tell them how to add fractions. What our brain should be able to do is tell us why we shouldn't do that, why that just makes no sense. Because we know what fractions are, and we know there's no way that that's correct. Right, so let's go through that. So let's talk about the fraction. Let's talk about this kind of thing here. It's called the denominator. Correctly, then hopefully you know that's not what we're looking for, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, what the fraction is out of a whole? Yeah, like the number five says to make a whole thing, a pizza or a rectangle or whatever, uh, you would need five of these pieces, right? The whole is cut into five pieces. That, that's what that tells us. So all this denominator tells us. How, like, what size pieces we're working with, right? Of course, we have to assume we're talking about two-thirds and, and four-fifths of the same kind of thing, right? Like two-thirds and four-fifths of a pizza, and not two-thirds of a pizza and four-fifths of, of a battleship. It's, it's not going to add this together. It doesn't make any sense. So the units are the same. 
Um, yeah, so it would take five of these things to make the whole. So that five tells us about how big a piece of this thing is. So just using that information, reminding yourself that that's the case, then why would it not make sense to add thirds to fifths? This uh, trend. Making the piece bigger than it already is. Making the piece bigger than it already is? How do you mean? So if one piece on the four fifths, uh -huh. that fifth is the whole piece, and you can't make that one piece bigger by adding three to it. Yeah, you would be, yeah, you're changing information. You're saying, yeah. like if we add the five and the three, now we're changing how big the pieces are, and we're changing their identity. And uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. No. Right? Just by putting them together, it doesn't change how big the sizes are. Two apples and four oranges. Right? I just I just said I have two and I've identified them as apples and three I've identified them as oranges. I try to put them together, you know, in a bag, and I say that I have uh, six of something in this bag. That's not really a way to communicate that, right? Does that make sense? Comparing unlike things. I put two of these things with four of these other kinds of things, and I can't really say, hey, six. Ooh, for me? I had six of them. Oh, that's awesome. That's the last one. Um, so, one way to look at it, like hopefully there's like the alarm bell that goes off that you just try to add the denominators together or that you try to add things that don't have the same denominator. The denominator is giving us a piece of the fraction's identity. It is a piece of the pie that is this big. This is a piece of the pie that's this big, they are different bignesses, right? They're different sizes, and we can't compare them, and we can't put them together. We can't say how many we have until they're the same size. So now we have to worry about that. We make them the same size. So let's take a look at what these guys look like. It's always nice to have a picture. cut the whole thing into thirds. Okay, that's what the denominator tells me. It tells me the whole thing is cut into three pieces. And this two tells me what does the two tell me? Yeah. How many pieces like, that aren't there or are there? Yeah, they're okay, they're not there or are there. Uh, let's say there are there, okay? It's easier to think about things we like can hold. And so we, let's say we hold in our hands two of these pieces that are of the size, three of them makes the whole, okay? Over here we have something that's cut into fifths, okay? So that part's the denominator, just telling me how big the piece is, and I've colored them in to show you that we have four of them. We possess four of these things. All right, so now we'll make the point again with a picture. We try to put those things together, it doesn't make any sense. If you say that I have one, two, three, four, five, six out of something, they're just not comparable. So, without saying we get the common denominator and telling me how to find a common denominator, because that's not what we're after, if that was never a problem, if you never ever didn't find the common denominator when adding fractions, I wouldn't be presenting this to you. But it does happen, it happens pretty often. So, in the picture, you know, imagining like a pizza or a pie or whatever might be circular shaped, how would we physically do something to this and to this? So that we can say we have, and we can just count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's how many we have, and this is how big they are. Okay? I have uh, Hudson. Um, you salad into fifths? Each of them. Yeah. All of them. Everyone, yeah, you cut them into five pieces. that into each of those into five pieces and each of these into three pieces. Three pieces. If I drew these more accurately, then it would be clear that all of these are exactly the same size. If I take three pieces and cut them into five each, and five pieces and cut them into three each, then I have now the same size pieces. Yeah? So, 
we just did this. We took three of these things, three groups of now five things, multiplication, right? Three groups of five. Over here, we took five things. We split it into three, so we have five groups of three. So now altogether, the whole is made of 15 pieces in both cases. Now all we have to do is count up how many we have. How many are shaded in? I could count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Or I can use additions, a uh, quick little shortcut called multiplication. So I know I had two of these pieces to start with. I know that in trying to do like cutting the whole thing into 15 pieces, I know that I have cut each of these into five pieces. So I have two groups of five. So I have that many, that many pieces to make the whole. That's how many of those pieces I have. Here and we had five things. Uh, we cut it into three pieces each, so these got cut into three pieces each. So all together, if we wanted to count them quickly without just going around and counting them, we know we had four of them, which have got into three pieces, and now we have twelve of those. So we come over here, we got ten fifteenths plus twelve. in your notes, unless you are 100% clear, not on what to do, okay? If you're clear on what to do with fractions when you're adding them and you never ever make mistakes, okay, that's great. You should deepen your understanding, all right? You should be able to explain this to a third grader, a fourth grader, a fifth grader, right? When they have questions. Can we simplify it too? Uh, this guy? Yeah, like, is 15 goes into 22, so it's really essentially five. But she doesn't go into 22. Why? Oh, yeah, it's What? Oh, you mean, okay, simplify it next different from writing as a mixed number. Yeah. Yeah. We okay. Got that right. Uh, I would say, I don't care. If you leave your answer 22 fifteenths, it's the same as, what, 1 and 7 fifteenths. It's yeah. the same information. They're equal, right? Yeah. Um, in, in real life, I would want to know that I have one and, and seven fifteenths of a dollar, of a gallon, of a, like a thing. But in mathematics, when we want to use that number and, and combine it with other numbers, what's the first thing you do when you have a mixed number and you want to like multiply it by another fraction? Yeah. Change it back. Change it back. Like we're always taking these mixed numbers and just changing them back. All right. So. I always just leave them, leave them like that. If that's my answer, that's my answer. I mean, if, you, if you go on to AP Calculus and you take the AP Calculus test and you give them the answer 22 fifteenths and it's not 1 and 7 fifteenths, they don't care. Right? It is as big as 1 and 7 fifteenths. So do whatever you like. If you like 1 and 7 fifteenths, you do that. If you like this and you don't care to convert it over, that's fine. Um, if you don't know how to switch between, that's a different story. Okay? If you don't understand that, if it's just a choice of do the work or don't do the work, just leave it like that, all right? Is that three times more information than you asked for? Okay, good. That's how I uh, operate. Okay, so here's my question, and I've succeeded if the answer is yes. Did you gain any new insight at all to adding fractions? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. Uh, are there any questions about adding? another example or anything like that or can we close the book on adding fractions that's my question wouldn't it just be easier just to find a common denominator isn't that what we did yeah, yeah but you don't have to do all the pi thing and all that no but i want you to see what's happening when you do that if you just know that that you are supposed to find a common denominator but you don't know what it means you don't know why you multiply both numerator and denominator by five there, you do all these things, you don't understand why, and I would like you to change that. Okay. But if you get this, and it's just all a review of stuff you know, and there's no new insight, uh, then okay. Then, then you never made mistakes when you were adding fractions uh, conceptually. I don't talk about, I'm not talking about like I accidentally four times three is ten. Like not that kind of mistake. I mean conceptual mistake where you don't understand. Um, but the reason I, I bother to go through it is that I've taught 
year after year, and year after year, I get asked, do I add straight across, or do I need to get a common denominator when I multiply fractions, and all this kind of confusion, okay? Um, so I want you, I want to give you the tools so that when you ask yourself, what am I supposed to do, you answer the question, not just with a rote memorized, here's what you do, it's okay, let me think about this. I can't just add them straight across, why? Why can't I just add these fractions straight across? Give me some reason why that doesn't make any sense. Hey, the two apples and the four oranges doesn't make six oranges? No, we got two different kinds of things. Okay. It's not comparable. Why, because these denominators tell us something about this stuff, right, whatever this stuff is. Let's say it's of a pizza. Well, these, uh, these pieces are much bigger than these pieces, right? Because you only need three to make a whole, here you need five to make a whole. Okay, so, yeah, I want you to say that to yourself, rather than, uh, oh, no, I remember these words. Find common denominators when you add, or whenever you add fractions. We can understand why that is much, much stronger. Okay? So, what do we say? Can we close the book on adding fractions, or? Other questions? Okay. I'm going to see, I, of course I can't know, but I'm going to see a big reduction in how many mistakes you make in adding fractions. If you haven't succeeded in it, then you're just removing all mistakes altogether. Okay. So now, multiplying fractions. Let's just use those same fractions. Is everybody familiar with that little dot? As multiplying? Okay. So, here's a really, a, I think the biggest one, the biggest mistake that gets made is in multiplying fractions, kind of clueless as to what to do. All right? I'm going to go into an explanation of why we, excuse me, multiply straight across. You may know that's what you're supposed to do, but if you don't know why, then you have something to learn. Okay? So, let's first, do it wrong in the way that most people do it incorrectly and then talk about just why that can't be. That couldn't possibly be right. It may not answer what we're supposed to do, but it does remind you that that's not correct, okay? So a lot of times people will see two fractions, they'll multiply and they'll think, cross multiply. There's two fractions, they're multiplying. Okay, so let's indulge that just for a second. Let's say we take two, we multiply it by five, and here we put a 10, okay? Three, Four, and now we get 12. You see this a lot, and it's a real shame because we don't need to be making mistakes like that. Uh, there's no reason for it. Okay. So let me just quickly give you a way, hopefully like a, a little alarm bell that'll go off in your head when you think maybe I should cross multiply in this situation. Let me show you how that can be. Let's, uh, let me take a quick example over here to the side. If I, do, if I tell you to do two times three, is it any different to do three times two? Times three, three times three, that's called the commutative property. It's the same thing. Two times three is six, three times two is six, so it's the same. So whenever I multiply real numbers, okay, every number you ever worked with, I believe, is a real number. Have you ever worked with an imaginary number? No, okay. So, they exist, there are imaginary numbers. But you've only ever worked with real numbers, and whenever we multiply them, we can switch the order. It's called the commutative property. So I'm gonna switch the order of these, and if I switch the order of these fractions, and cross multiplying is correct, then I should get the same answer. So here's four fifths on the left, two thirds on the right. Okay, let's do the exact same thing. We did two times five is 10, so it'll be four times three is 12, five times two is 10. Okay, so couldn't possibly be right. The reason why I can do two times three or three times two is because you get the same thing, two times three is six, three times two is six, but two thirds times four fifths using cross multiplication is 12 tenths, and to switch the order, you get 12 or 10 twelfths, right? By the way, what, what are these two fractions called? Can you flip it over? Reciprocal. Reciprocal, yeah. So I think that's a reciprocal. That, possibly, that couldn't possibly be correct. Couldn't possibly have to cross multiply. That can't be the right thing to do, okay? In, in a second, uh, drawing a star, it's not that hard. Um, I'm gonna come back and explain to you, remind you what cross multiplying is for, but I don't wanna go too far down that rabbit trail before we, we go into what we are supposed to do. So two thirds times four fifths. 
So let's come back to what we are supposed to do, what we are actually looking for. Okay. So before we go into that, let me just take, uh, say, 10 times 1 half and, and remind you what we're looking for when we do this. Simple example. When we multiply by a fraction, that's what I want to talk about. Well, I want to find half of a 10, half of a group of 10. Does that make sense? Right, if I have a bunch of a group of 10, I want to know what half of that group is. Okay, so half of 10. I'm just going to think of it like that. Same way, 2 thirds times 4 fifths, 4 fifths of 2 thirds. What is 4 fifths of a group of 2 thirds? Okay, now it starts to be a little more tricky. Right, but I want you to think of it that way, and then we're going to use a picture to wrap this around right here. Okay? So, looking for 4 fifths of 2 thirds. How much is that? First, let's look at two thirds. There it is, two thirds right there. I want to figure out how much is four fifths of this. Right. Let me just quickly use this example of, say, five. It's really easy. Right. Five. What's one fifth of this group of? I shouldn't even draw it like that. That's confusing. Let's just say I have actual five whole things. How much is one fifth of that group? Like what would be five times one fifth? One, right? Just one of those is one fifth of the, the group, right? Because it's easy to split it into five pieces. That's convenient. How about what's four fifths of this? Four, four, four right? I take it. It's cut into five pieces already. Convenient. So I just look at four of them, four things. That's four fifths of that group of five. And when it's over here, it becomes a little bit strangier, okay? Um, first of all, this was already like in five pieces. This is not in five pieces, okay? What do we do about that? You have to cut it into five pieces. I cut, it would be nice to cut the, like the whole thing into five pieces, but then our lines like don't match up, right? Yeah. So we're just going to have to cut every one of these pieces into five pieces. Let's see what happens then. This will translate into something mathematically, part of the multiplying straight across, right? So we're going to just cut all of these into five pieces. Okay. So now that we have gone through the whole thing and we've cut everything into five pieces, we've really just taken the denominators and multiplied them together. We just changed how many pieces make the whole, right? The whole used to be made of three pieces. Now each of those three pieces is counted to five more pieces. How many pieces does it take? Three times five pieces. Fifteen pieces. Okay. So now in, in each of these pieces, we want to figure out how much is four fifths. Just like over here, we just kind of shaded four out of the five things. These two, three, four. Okay, that's four out of the five of those. There's four out of the five of these. Color these in. We have it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight. Or we have two groups of four. That's two times four. Okay. So by multiplying two thirds times four fifths, when we want to find four fifths of two thirds, suddenly the pieces become more. There's more of them. Right? They're smaller, so they take up. They still make up the whole. But instead of being in thirds, the whole thing is in fifteenths. We need to do that so that we could count them up. Right? And then we just look at each of those and we count up four of those. How many is that? Well, we have two of the things are cut into five pieces. Uh, and we have four of those five. So we have two times four is eight. Right? If I do it the other way, four fifths and two thirds, you'll find you get the exact same number of fifteenths. So I started with fifths. If I'm really good at this, Five pieces, and I have uh, four of those. Let's see, that should have been five. Well, I guess I'll, yeah, that'll all work out. And then I do the reverse. I, I find two thirds of four fifths. I cut these into thirds. Okay. I want to find two fifths, so I count these two, and these two, and these two, and these two, and these two. Okay. And I still have eight fifteenths. Okay. Same thing happens. 
five pieces, we cut each of those five pieces into three pieces, so now it takes 15 pieces to make a whole. Okay. I did have four of those pieces. Each one of those, I'm gonna count two of the smaller pieces that we made, two of the 15ths. So uh, four times two would give me the eight 15ths. Okay. Any, any questions about multiplying fractions together? We multiply it straight across, not because our teacher told us to, right? But for one thing, we know we should not multiply cross, cross multiply, because we don't get the same answer if we change the order. That's just a convincing argument that cannot, that couldn't be the way that you're supposed to do it. If you're trying to make a decision between the two things, you should at least be able to prove yourself that's not right. Even if you can't recreate this whole thing, right? If that wasn't completely clear, you should at least not do that. Um, and then we can go through this whole explanation again and see why we do multiply straight across. We're just increasing the number of pieces that it takes to make the whole, and then we're counting up how many of those pieces we have. And real quick, why, what, what is cross multiplication? Why is that in my head if I'm not supposed to multiply fractions that way? Yes? Oh yeah, that's cross canceling, right? Or cross simplifying. So like all this stuff is in your head and you just kind of forget. So cross multiply, let me just quickly go over that. Say I can, uh, it comes from proportion. Say I can wash three cars in five hours, and so I, I tell you that in order to use proportion. So if I can wash three cars in five hours, how many cars can I wash in any number of hours? 22 hours, let's say. A lot of work, but we set up this proportion where it should be the same ratio. I can wash three cars in five hours, so I should be able to wash X cars in 22 hours. Here's where the cross multiply comes in. Multiply straight across the equal sign, right? 5x, 5x equals 66 divided by 5. x equals 66 fifths cars in 22 hours, OK? So we'll talk more about proportions later, but that's where cross multiplication is being misfiled in your head. It should be filed under proportions, but it got filed under multiplying fractions, if that's a mistake that you make. Okay. Did you, do you understand multiplying fractions any better than you did before? Fantastic. That's what I want. Okay, if you understand it the same, then sorry. Sorry that you had to watch that. Okay. Last few seconds. So two thirds divided by. When we divide fractions, we multiply by the. So okay. Now here's the mistake that gets made. What reciprocal? Which reciprocal? The reciprocal of which one? So we forget, right? And and forgetting means we're trying to go about this the wrong way. Let's use this. If I have a fraction, I'm just going to come over here and give you an example of uh, 6 elevenths. It's a fraction, right? I'm allowed to multiply this by 5 as long as I multiply this by 5, right? And that's how we find common denominators. We multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing. Let's talk about why we can do that. How much is that worth? 1. Can you multiply 6 elevenths by 1? Can you multiply numbers by 1 and not change them? You can't multiply by 1. one. Yeah, well, it's the same number. Yeah, 5 times 1 is 5, 6 times 1 is 6, right? If I multiply by 1, I haven't changed the number. Okay, so I want to use that. So this fraction, this big fraction, I like to draw a big one like that so I know which, one, which fraction is supposed to be where. I'm going to multiply this fraction by 7 fifths, 7 fifths over 7 fifths. Okay, so if you're trying to figure out the reciprocal of which one, this one will come out to what the answer. So what happens down here? In the, in the denominator, what do we get down here? What's that? Well, you get one. Yeah, you get, you get 35 plus 35, that's just one. So we get one down here. What do we know about when you put a number over one? Does it make a difference that you put it over one? No. Makes it look a little different, kind of makes it look like a fraction. So if you need to combine it with some other fraction, it makes it easier. But 
no, this, this is over one, it's like redundant, I don't need it. So whatever it is that happens up here, that's the, the answer that I'm looking for, right? So we have 14 over 15, and 14 fifteenths. Okay. So there's like, not a memory way, not a, I remember which one to make the reciprocal, it's a mathematical way. If you do it wrong this way, if you get it backwards, here's what happens. Okay? You should be multiplying by the reciprocal of the denominator here and there. If you get it wrong, if you get it backwards, this is what will happen. Not a big deal. What do I get up here? 6 over 6. 1. What do I get down here? 15 over 14. That doesn't look right at all, does it? You can divide a number by 1, and that thing, you know, it's just that. If I take 1 divided by that, well, that, that's not as simple. But this is, this is still correct. It's just to write it as simple as possible, we write it as 14 and 15. Okay? Um, let me try and write down the what, nine problems that I want you to do. 2.2. Eight, 21, and 36. <coughs> 2 3. And I will text this out, so if you feel like taking off right as the bell rings, you feel free. And the text will go out for you. Oh, you're going to text them to us? That's right. When you guys leave, I'll schedule a reminder to come out to you at the end of school. That's all I have. Bye. so many. Yeah. You leave like in 10 minutes. My bag is already in the library, so I'm already. Oh, wait, when are they supposed to announce this? I never had it. Homework on the bus. Listen, this happens pretty much every time we have a sporting event, and people say, oh, we're supposed to leave, and then well, they're going to leave without it. Never, never left without you, ever. It's always been announced. You can always get there. Okay? But, these being the way they are, yeah. you guys can go ahead and go if you need to go ahead and do get going. Tell us. We're done. Go. I feel like I want to throw up. Like, Maybe uh, just take a jug of milky milk. Well, obviously, yeah. They're going to get killed by Townsend.